All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video with Mr. Kenton. I know it's been a while, but here we are. I'm finally getting to making these videos for thermochemistry and equilibrium and hopefully acids and bases here soon. But, um, you know, we've already done these units, so hopefully I can be a little bit more precise and concise in my explanations. But thank you for joining me. Glad that you could be a part of this. Um, and I want us to go back and I want us to think through thermochemistry. That's what unit six is corresponding to. And you can find this information in chapter five in the text mostly. Um, there were some things that we looked at in chapter 11 as well. Um, but the bulk of this content is going to be coming from chapter five in our Brown and LeMay textbook. So glad you're with me. I'm glad you're here. Let's go ahead and get started um, by looking at section 6.1. Right. And so Within this video, we're going to be mainly focusing on 6.1, but the next couple videos are going to focus on 6.1 through 6.3, which is going to correspond to sections 5.1 and 5.3 in the text. Okay. Now, 6.1 focuses in on this idea of endothermic and exothermic processes. Now, for us, we have a good idea of what endothermic and exothermic means, right? I would anticipate that if you guys saw the term endothermic, you would know that heat is being absorbed by whatever it is that we're talking about. Um, and we associate endothermic with having a positive delta H, which we know is enthalpy value, right? And we're going to be talking more about enthalpy and things like that in later videos, so just hang with me here. And then we know that exothermic is that heat is being released, right? So think exo, exiting, endo, going into. Uh, but with our exothermic processes, delta H is going to have a negative value, so our enthalpy is going to be negative. Now, we understand these things. You've seen examples of endothermic and exothermic processes, but we're going to start to dive into it. how did we define that this would be endothermic versus exothermic by looking at systems versus surroundings. That's really what we're going to be moving into next. And so there you have it. So when we say something is endothermic or exothermic, what we're typically referring to is we're saying that the system is what we're defining, and we're saying that energy is either going into or leaving the system from the surroundings or into the surroundings, right? And so for us, from a chemistry standpoint, when we say a system, it's going to include the molecules that we want to study. Um, and if you're looking at this particular example of the piston that's over here, you've got hydrogen and oxygen molecules that are in this piston. Those are the molecules that we're studying. So we're saying that's the system, right? And then the surroundings would be classified as anything else that's interacting with your system, okay? So those are the things that are outside of that system. Now, in our case of our piston, um, what we've got, we've got the cylinder, which the gas is being contained in, and then you've got the piston, the, the portion that can compress or can be pushed against by the gas molecules. Okay. Now, when you start looking at, it says the universe, this is going to be the system and the surroundings together. So um, we could go as broad as, yeah, think about it, like, the, the solar systems, the galaxies, the things that exist in our entire universe, we could go that big, or you could make it smaller and focus in on the specific system and surroundings that are impacting a, a specific chemical reaction that you're looking at. Okay. Now, there are different types of systems that we need to be familiar with. An open system is going to allow for us to transfer both heat and mass with its surroundings right? And so in open systems, you have to be much more careful here because um, you're going to have heat that's being lost or being transferred into the surroundings. You could even have mass that's being transferred into the surroundings, right? Um, for closed systems, closed systems, they're going to allow only for heat to be transferred. So they're going to be closed off. Matter cannot escape from that particular system. And the only thing that's going to be allowed to move or to be transferred is going to be heat energy, right? And then you have isolated systems where there will be no transfer of heat or mass that's allowed. I don't want to say the word allowed, but that, that there's going to be a limited or no transfer of heat or mass with between the systems and the surroundings, okay? 
So that's our idea of system versus surroundings. And within the context of chemistry, a lot of times we're going to be dealing with closed systems, right? We're going to be focusing on the energy that's being transferred from our system into the surroundings or from the surroundings into the system. Now, it leads us into this idea of energy, right? And so from a physics perspective, even from a chemistry perspective, energy can be simply defined as the ability to do work or to transfer heat, okay? And so if you've had a physics background, you know that for something, the ability to do work, what that means is that you're, you're causing an object that has mass to move in the same direction that a force is being applied on that object, right? So if you could think about it, for example, if you think about a chair, right? If I apply a force pushing the chair forward, right? My force is applying onto the chair and it moves forward in the direction of my force. That's an example of me doing work, okay? And work can be, be abbreviated with a lowercase w. Now, Energy can be in many different forms. So you've got energy in the form of work, but there's another form of energy that, that's used to cause the temperature of an object to rise, and that's called heat, which is abbreviated with a Q in chemistry, right? So when heat is added into a substance, what happens? The temperature of the object increases, and that increase in temperature, that increase in energy, referring to the heat that was added there. Now, in this particular chapter, our focus is on thermodynamics, and that sounds like a scary term. It's not. Um, thermodynamics is the study of energy transformations just in general, right? But within the, this branch of chemistry that we're going to be looking, about, looking at, we're going to be looking at thermochemistry, which is going to apply specifically to the field of chemical reactions and the energy transfers that take place within a chemical reaction, right? So... We've got the broad topic of thermodynamics, but then we're going to narrow it in within the scope of chemistry and how that impacts chemical reactions. Now, heat and work transfer. So the thing about energy, we know about the law of conservation of energy that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Well, what happens in systems and surroundings is that heat and work get transferred between those two things. Right, so that you can have a net energy that's always the same, that's always equal to each other. Right, so heater work is always going to be transferred between your system and your surroundings. And so, what that could mean is that if your system is what you're studying, the energy of the system is going to be equal to the negative energy of the surroundings, right? And we can think of that as the perspective of the energy. If the, if the system is gaining energy, that means that the surroundings would be losing energy. And if you think about this picture over here with the boiling water, if this container is our system or the water specifically is our system, energy is going into the system, right? Right? So that'd be an endothermic process. And then the surroundings from the burner, from the glass bowl um, that's touching the water, energy is leaving those things and moving into the system, right? Now, uniquely, if no work is done, if, if energy is being transferred and it's not causing an object to move by a force being applied to it, then essentially the heat of the system is going to be equal to negative heat of the surroundings, Now, with our quantity of heat, Q, we want to think of this as the amount of thermal energy that's being transferred from something hotter to something colder. Now, this is always going to be the case. This is very intuitive to us, right? We understand that if we were to touch a hot object, unfortunately, energy isn't going to transfer from our hand into the hot object. What's going to happen is that energy from the hot object is going to move into our hand, and that's why touching something hot burns you, right? Or likewise, if you touch something cold, instead of 
your hand getting warmer, what happens is energy is leaving your hand, going into that colder object um, so that it can warm up the colder object. So energy, and specifically heat, will always be transferred from a hotter object to a colder one. All right, and then last little thing that we need to communicate here, when we say energy from is moving from the system to the surroundings, that means that Q is going to have a negative value um, for that overall process because if the system is what we're focusing in on, if energy is leaving the system and going into the surroundings, that means heat was lost. It's exothermic. Um, if energy is transferring from the surroundings into the system, so again, our focus is on the system as our object of study, energy is moving into the system, then that means that Q has to be positive. Energy is coming into our system. So then Q would have a positive value. Okay. Now, something else that I want you guys to note over here is that it's talking about the overall energy change, and we're seeing how when energy goes into something, Q is greater than zero. That means it's positive, right? But it also mentions, you got this other error talking about work done on or work done by, right? So what you've got here, you've, you've got this kind of like a vault, and you've got internal energy, the amount of energy that is stored within the system. And so the way that the system can gain energy can happen two ways. It can either gain heat or work can be done on the system by the surroundings. So, for example, um, you think back to that piston example. If the piston moves down on gases, that means work is being done on the system. So it's adding in energy into our system, right? Now, ways in which our system can lose energy could be by giving off heat, in an exothermic process, or the system can do work itself, right? It can cause action to happen on its surroundings. So think about the piston example. Let's say that the gas particles begin to push the piston up after being compressed. Well, that means the system is doing work, and so it's losing some of that internal energy that it's gained, right? I hope that makes sense. Now, heat, work, and energy... How are they all related? What, what does all this look like? Now, we've already addressed it that energy used to move an object over distance is work. So work equals force times distance. Okay. Um, force, typically going to be measured in newtons. Distance going to be measured in meters. Um, and so when you've got a newton times a meter, you end up with a um, form of energy, which is joules, right? Heat is the energy that's transferred from a hotter object to a colder object. Again, because it's a form of energy, it's going to be measured in joules. Now, again, remember, energy has two definitions. It's whether it's the capacity for an object to do work or it's the transfer of heat. That's energy. Now, I alluded to this on, a pre on the previous slide. We talked about how the first law of thermodynamics states that energy is always conserved. And so what we mean by that is that the internal energy of a system is going to be the sum of all the kinetic and potential energies of all the components of the system. Right? Now this internal energy, we're going to call it E. And so by definition, the change in internal energy, delta E, is going to be the final energy of the system minus the initial energy of the system, okay? And so then we've got this idea delta E equals E final minus E initial. Now, in this case, again, that's the change in internal energy equals the final internal energy minus the initial internal energy. Now, a way we can track delta E is we can look at whether or not energy is exchanged between your system and surroundings. And again, we've seen it's either exchanged as either heat or work. So another way that we can represent delta E is we could say delta E is going to be equal to Q plus W. Right? So the sum of Q and W is going to tell us the value of the change in internal energy. Okay? 
All right. Now, we're going to move into talking about a specific type of scenario that's specific in chemistry, which is going to allow us to essentially solve for internal energy with respect to Q or enthalpy. Now, within chemistry, a lot of the context is that you have some gas or you've got some reaction that's going to do pressure volume work. Now, what that means is um, it's moving an object some distance and it's changing the volume. Now, usually this, we think about this usually in an open container, the only work done is by a gas pushing on the surroundings or by the surroundings pushing on a gas. Again, we've got this example of a piston, right? And so what we can do in that particular scenario is we can measure the work done by the gas if the reaction is done in a vessel that's been fitted with a piston, right? Um, and so we understand that what a piston does is that essentially it can compress a gas, but then if pressure gets exerted on it, it can decompress, um, and that change in volume would be the work that's being done. So work done by a piston can be solved by saying work equals negative P times delta V. Now, in chemistry, what tends to happen is that processes tend to take place at constant pressure. That's what we typically deal with. And so in those particular cases, the only work that's done is this pressure volume work, which is exactly what we're dealing with here. Now, we can account for the, the heat flow during this process by measuring the enthalpy of the system. Now, enthalpy, there's lots of E terms that we have in this unit. Enthalpy is the internal energy plus the product of pressure and volume work, or plus the, plus the product of pressure and volume. So enthalpy is going to be internal energy plus the product of pressure and volume. So H equals E plus PV. Now, again, from a chemistry perspective, we see this piston. What you can do is you can attach a piston to an apparatus like what we see here. And so you've got a chemical reaction. You've got a, a solid and you've got a gas. And when you mix them together, you get the production. So you've got a solid and an aqueous solution, an acid. Now, when you mix those solutions, a gas is evolved. A gas is produced. And so what's going to happen is that gas is going to move up that tube. And as it does, it's going to cause that piston to, to move up. So for us, we need to be able to measure what's the, what's the work, what's the energy transfer that's happening in this particular process, which is where this enthalpy piece comes into play. Now, if enthalpy H equals E plus PV, we need to think about, okay, we're kind of seeing some connections here. Well, how do we use this? Well, enthalpy, we think about it in terms of systems changing, right? So when the system changes, but you're at constant pressure, the change in enthalpy delta H is going to be delta H equals delta, let's put that on the outside, parentheses E plus PV. Right, because again, we're looking at the change in enthalpy. Well, we can apply that to the change in our internal energy plus pressure, the product of pressure and volume. Well, we can re rewrite that as delta E equals, excuse me, delta H equals delta E plus P delta V. Okay, now what we're looking at here is a derivation for how we can get delta H to equal Q. Right now, from this equation, if you're looking at this particular spot right here, we should notice that we've got delta E. Remember, previously we stated that delta E was equal to Q plus W. Right, so we could substitute delta E into our expression. Right, and so, um We've got that. Um, and then we also know that W from the previous slide, W in our case is negative P delta V. All right. You could also rearrange that. You could say that negative W equals P plus P delta V. 
Um, and so then you're going to have W and you're going to have a, a, um, a minus W. And so what ends up happening, your W's cancel out and you're left with delta H equals Q. Now, again, this is only going to be true at constant pressure. It must be at constant pressure um, because then the change in enthalpy will be only related to the amount of heat that's gained or lost by your system. Okay. Now, it's, this is an important derivation, but and I, I think it's important for you to understand how we get to it. But ultimately, we're going to be dealing a lot with this particular relationship. And we're going to talk about how we can solve for enthalpy in later videos. Last thing I want us, or we've got two more things I want us to look at, and then we'll, I'll be done with this video for today. Um, so with delta E, Q, and W, we need to understand what their signs are communicating to us. Because with energy, the sign is telling you something about the movement of the energy. It doesn't mean that energy is being destroyed. It doesn't mean that, that there's somehow this energy has been lost and is never being found again. It's just telling you about the direction it's moving. And so just to kind of summarize, we know for Q, if it's positive, it means the system's gaining heat. It's endothermic. If Q is negative, it means our system lost heat. It means it's going to the surroundings. Right? For W, we looked at this. If W is positive, that means work's being done on our system because we're adding to the internal energy of our system. If W is negative, it means work's being done by our system. It means our system is losing energy in the form of work. It's doing work on the surroundings. And then for delta E, if delta E is positive, then that means that your system has gained energy, whether it's through work, whether it's through heat, whether it's a combination of both. Um, and if it's negative, it means that there has been a net loss of energy by the system. That means that the system has given off more energy than it was able to take in. And lastly, we need to talk about units of energy. I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but the SI unit for energy is the joule. Now, a joule is a kilogram times a meter squared per second squared. Okay. Um, now, a joule is not very much in terms of a unit, so a lot of times you'll see problems where you're, be, you're being given kilojoules, um, and you'll even see processes where you've got hundreds, maybe even hundreds of thousands of kilojoules that are being released in a given process. So joules and kilojoules are going to be what's most common in the problems that we're going to be dealing with. Now, there is an older non-SI unit, but it's still in widespread use today, and that's the calorie. Yeah, it's the, the same type of Calorie, like in the sense of like what's in food, but we have to, to make a distinction here. There's the little C calorie, like what we've designated right here, and then there's the big C calorie. So when we're talking about food, um, the food calorie is just a capital C, right? Um, and so interestingly enough, one big C calorie is the equivalent of 1,000 calories or 1 kcal, okay? And... Um, so that means when you're eating something, you're taking in a thousand little C calories. Now, for a conversion perspective, one calorie is going to be equal to 4.184 joules. All right. So I'm going to stop there with this video, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for, for tuning in and watching this. I hope that this is insightful. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. You know where to find me. Um, it's good to be back doing these videos again. Hope these will be helpful. Um, and I look forward to seeing you guys again soon. Take care.